Uh, very good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for joining this morning. I know it's a cold morning. I was not expecting these many turnups, but thank you so much. Really good to see you all here. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is about ISR 1100 devices. If you know ISR devices, if you have been working on, I think all of you, most of the Cisco customers are familiar with ISR devices. Those were very, very popular and very useful devices. So we are taking this to a new level with ISR 1100 devices. You might already be having some of you, like I was talking to gentleman sitting here, he has around 1,000 units of it. Anybody else is having ISR 1100 in their network already? Oh, that's good. Every time I see numbers are increasing. Like uh, I have presented the session in uh, Orlando, Cisco Live. So I have quite a few people there. Now it has increased to some more people. So that's good to see. We are actually integrating lots and lots of feature. We are enhancing the devices in terms of uh, uh, you know, new innovations and all, SD-WANs and DNS center integration, et cetera. Lots of things are coming with this device. So future is actually very bright with this device. So uh, let me start with a story. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about one of my experiences. Uh, from the past. So in 2016, I was in Cisco Live Vegas, and I had a session on VXLAN. I have completed my session, and after the session, we were just a few friends. I mean, we were sitting in the hotel bar, and we were talking about Cisco stuffs, definitely. We were enjoying the evening, and suddenly, what, what we, we have seen is a bartender coming to us and asked, are you guys working for Cisco? I said, yes, we work for Cisco, although it was not expected from a bartender to ask us this question. But uh, he said that, uh, surprisingly, I also worked for, for Cisco uh, 10 years ago. So I said, all right, uh, what, what did you working on? He said, uh, I, uh, Cisco used to manufacture a modem at that time, some kind of modem which was intended for the small office or probably uh, for you know, uh, individual customers sitting at home doing few things from the lab, home lab. So at that time, uh, Cisco was manufacturing this modem and he used to go to every, every home and install this modem. His point was <clears throat> that modem was very simple to implement, just plug and play. And he said that I don't know why Cisco has stopped making those devices, which is just plug and play. And now Cisco is making so complicated devices, which needs a skilled labor, CCIs, and you know, multiple years experience guys to implement it, configure it, and maintain those devices. Right? He was making a point there, but I was not able to understand. In 2016, I was not that wise enough. Today, I have become a little wise. Do I look a, a little wise? <laughs> I know, I need to grow some beard and all those things to look a, look a little wise. But from 2016 to 2019, what he was telling me that Cisco should manufacture devices which even a grandmother can power on, can plug in and start working on, on her stuff and all those things. So I was thinking that if, if, if a grandmother can power up a device, then what a jobless grandson is going to do with his life, right? But now, when uh, I have seen the innovations around me and I have seen what Cisco and other vendors are growing into, I think he was making a very valid point. Today, I'm fine with all those innovations. I'm fine if Cisco is bringing something which is plug and play. I'm fine because I'm seeing it happening, and I see that if you get the capability of uh, you know, not spending time on configuring those devices and, <clears throat> and spending time to manage those, figure out the issues, then you have all much, much better things to do in your life in terms of, in terms of your career, in terms of technically, and all those things. So with this particular note, why I'm talking about here, talking about this here, because ISR 1100 gives you a lot of these, these kind of plug and play capabilities, which I'll talk in a few of my slides as well. Let's get started, first of all. Uh, a few housekeeping things. Uh, I would like you to all join the uh, uh, Cisco WebEx teams. We have few TMEs sitting there. If they have some time for now, they would be answering your question if you put any question there. I would also answer your question in WebEx Teams. You can also ask me a question here in room as well. I'll try to answer it here as well. 
All right, Cisco ISR 1100. I'm going to talk about product overview and architecture a little, few solutions as well, what we have with this device. Uh, this is going to be, to be my agenda for the day. ISR 1100 portfolio introduction, first of all, then platform software overview, then basic troubleshooting solution um, overviews and key takeaways. Then I'll open a room for question answers for you, all right? Okay, so if you are aware of ISI devices, these are actually the philosophy behind ISI devices is that uh, these are integrating a lot of services, be it switching, be it security, be it uh, wireless LAN, be it wi wi wireless WAN, be it DSL, whatever, whatever features and services you need in a small uh, or branch office, it has those features and services. So this is the same thing what we are going to keep in ISR 1100 as well. And we are actually stacking on top of all those services with few new innovations, with few new technologies which, which everybody is talking about these days. And hence making this device very relevant for today's intelligent branch if you talk about. So this is all overall uh, you know, portfolio summary summary of a device, what it gives and what it does not. So uh, for WAN and application assurance, you have IWAN setup. IWAN, uh, which can be integrated with Epic EM, which can be integrated, uh, configured with DNS centers. And uh, apart from that, it also has SD-WAN integration. So very recently, we have re uh, released an SD-WAN iOS XC software, which can be installed on this. And if you have a little experience with WIPTELA devices, so there it, uh, there it was VH, uh, the name of that product was there, VH 100. Now uh, this is ISR 1100 with just, with, uh, with one uh, you know, software upgrade, you are going to get all the SD-WAN related features and uh, you can run SD-WAN on these devices. Advanced mobility. Uh, LTE Advanced and Mobility Express is the main key points here. So LTE Advance was not present in previous version if you talk about ISR 800 devices or even 1941 or whatever devices you have been using for LTE till now. Uh, LTE Advance is a new thing. It's a little faster and uh, it's a little scalable. Apart from that, uh, these devices are having an integrated access point which can also work as a controller. Right, so uh, which gives you Mobility Express. If you are aware of Cisco uh, wireless technologies, then Mobility Express was, is used to control access point just like uh, wireless controllers uh, in, in wireless domains. High performance, if we talk about 800 devices probably, it gives you around 10 times performance with the plain, tra plain text traffic. So we, you get high performance with that. Proactive security. Security is becoming pro pro proactive these days. You cannot wait for the attack uh, to happen in your network and then plan for it for, for next time mitigation. Actually, you need to be proactive. It has been like this always, but I don't know. I mean, all the attacks, actually, they trigger a lot of innovations in this field for, for OEMs, for vendors. So, but this device, uh, has very tight security features, which I'm going to talk about, like umbrella integration, ETA, trustworthy system, if you are aware of it. It has all those things integrated into it, which gives a feel-good factor for a secure device. Uh, I have a few slides to talk about it, uh, so let's wait for them. About the connectivity option, we have multi-connectivity options available for these devices, like Ethernet, DSL, uh, like wireless 802.11 AC Wave 2 it is. Wave, uh, Wave 2 is, was not present in previous Cisco devices. This is again a new generation of wireless, which give, gives you higher speed and better performance in uh, you know, wireless domain. Uh, if we talk about uh, manageability, definitely you have Epic EM and DNS Center. It is already there. Cisco Prime, everybody has been using it. And uh, apart from this, I'll talk a little about Web UI. Anybody has used Web UI, Cisco Web UI? No? Then this is a good place to talk about it. So Web UI is integrated into Cisco. If you 
talk about previous days for HTTP access to any of the Cisco device, you just need to do IP HTTP server or secure server. And then you put the IP address in the browser and you get, get a page which is very basic HTML page. You don't get anything else, right? Till the time you have Cisco configuration professional or something like that. So with web UI, you do just this, and you get a very nice interface to configure those devices. Configure, monitor, troubleshoot, in fact. Lots and lots of features are uh, uh, integrated there. It gives you investment protection with the help of Cisco One licensing integration. It gives you pay as you grow in terms of, uh, if you talk about <coughs> uh, licensing models, so we have performance licenses. So whenever you are ready for that kind of performance, you can actually go ahead and buy it. By default, it comes flat with 50 Mbps of crypto performance. For the plain traffic performance, th there is no cap over there. So you can actually um, use uh, all the limits that, that uh, ISR 1100 has for plain text traffic. So I'll talk about those performances in my upcoming slides. <sighs> You might be wondering that where exactly these devices are sitting in the Cisco portfolio. So here it is. We are not exactly replacing 800 devices, but if you talk about a replacement, I would say it is mostly replacing the 1941 devices which are going end of life these days. Uh, I mean, probably in 2020, you would not have uh, support for, I think, I think it is 2020, you would not have support for ISR 41 devices. Already EUL uh, and end of support is announced for those devices. So we are not replacing 800 devices, but 800 and 1100 devices would go hand in hand for a few days um, as per customer needs, because few customers want us to, uh, you know, be on 800 for now, and those are very, uh, you know, uh, very good partners with us. So we are not making it obsolete. It is not replacing 800 devices. At the same time, as I talked about Viptela devices, it is going to integrate, uh, it, is, it has integrated VH100 devices while we are talking. A uh, few people are already implementing SD-WAN on these devices. Apart from that, if you talk about other, uh, other, compo other uh, devices in the portfolio, like ISR 4000, 4, ASR 1000 devices, those are also now capable of running SD-WAN in your network. All right. Few comparisons, although uh, we are, I said that we are not replacing 800 devices with these, these devices, but still, since these are the closest ones, I'm going to compare them. Uh, the main noteworthy points what I have is Cisco SD-WAN, SD-WAN security, and operating system. So uh, you see that uh, operating system is now iOS XC on these devices. SD-WAN and SD-WAN security was not supported on 800 devices. It, it is supported on these devices now. LTE Advance. LTE Advance not supported on 800. This is supported here. Uh, 802.11 AC Wave 2, not supported on 800, it is supported here. Apart from that, it also has PoE Plus. So PoE Plus was not there with uh, LAN switching ports in 800 devices. And now the PoE Plus is also integrated there. A little bit more comparison. I talked about performances there. So <clears throat> for plane traffic, uh, there are two variants of these devices, basically. One is four port and one is eight port devices. So for eight port devices, for plain text, uh, for plain traffic where you are not basically using crypto or anything like that, you can go up to 1.7 Gbps of performance. And uh, which is around 10 times better performing than 800 device, what we had earlier. For crypto traffic, it can go up to 350 Mbps with the help of HSEC K9 license. I would talk about licensing in my upcoming slides. Separate control and data plane. We have quad core CPU running there. These are ARM CPUs. So. Uh, <clears throat> In those, uh, so there are four cores available in uh, that particular CPU. One core is dedicated for control plane. Two core is doing data plane task. And one core is sitting idle for now. So if, if you uh, know about ISR 4000 devices, there also we had something like that. And now we are using those 
cores which are not being utilized for a container services. So it is a possibility that in future we, although I'm not aware of any roadmap as of now, but it is a possibility that in future we integrate some of the services like this on these devices, making them more capable, all right? Next gen, gen uh, WAN, so we already talk about LTE Advance. In LTE Advance, basically what happens is uh, we have career aggregation. So career aggregation was not present in LTE, LTE 3.9 if you talk about. So what career aggregation means, suppose in this uh, city of Barcelona, we have multiple uh, spectrums available with the telecom. So you can actually attach to one of those spectrum if you are using an, uh, an LTE, uh, LTE enabled device. But with the career aggregation, you can attach, uh, ISP can give you better performance by aggregating all three spectrums, and that's how it gives you better performance in 4G. So it supports career aggregation. Uh, Cisco iOS XE, definitely it is more programmable than the legacy iOS, classic iOS, what we have. So, um, you know, NetConf, RESTConf, Yang model, GRPC for, for telemetry, all those supports are coming with the newer releases. So with 16.10.1, which was released very recently, we had this uh, telemetry integrated into it. And with every release, we are integrating few things uh, uh, to these devices, making it more capable and more uh, reliable. You know, we are fixing bugs also. Uh, wireless, we talked about uh, it. it. It supports 802.11 AC. Uh, how, how AC Wave 2, basically, how it is different from Wave 1 is, uh, so uh, in Wave 1, there were slots divided. So for, for a particular time slice, you can talk to one of the wireless connected device. Now with AC uh, Wave 2, you can actually talk to all of the devices which are connected to that particular access point at a single time slice. So it is more capable and more, uh, uh, you know, fast, better, uh, better performance. VPN acceleration, yeah, uh, we have a dedicated crypt crypto chip. That hardware is on the, uh, you know, on router fab uh, fabric, and it pro it does encryption decryption. So it is not done in CPU, which is giving better capability. Uh, you know, it is keeping CPU uh, less utilized. And since there is a dedicated crypto chip, it gives you better uh, performance in crypto traffic as well. Pay as you grow model, it is a licensing model. I'll talk a little bit uh, about licensing. But the main import important thing what I'm going to talk about is trustworthy system. So when I heard about this term, trustworthy system, I thought it is another marketing jargon what I'm going to, un I need to understand, which I never understand. And I need to explain about it. Well, I was very, I was not very comfortable talking about trust, trustworthy system uh, in these slides. So it it looks very vague with the name of it, trustworthy system. What exactly it is? But when I read about it, now I understand why trustworthy system is important in our world. I'll talk about three attacks which happened on Cisco devices. Real attacks. Uh, these are documented documented on Cisco websites as well. I can provide the link. Actually, I was trying, I, I had to put a link in this slide, but I could not. I put, I'll put it in WebEx team. For that blog, you can read through it. Uh, so trustworthy systems or un, uh, uh, of untrustworthy world. This is very important today. Why? Because of these attacks. One attack, uh, it happened in year 2011-12. What? This malware did is it has modified the code which was sitting on the flashcard of the, of the router and now reloaded the router. So the modification, what it has done is it has changed the Defi Hellman code. It did something with the Defi Hellman key exchange code. And now that Defi Hellman key exchange code has become weaker so that it can intercept all those communication which was happening with the help of IPsec. And hacker was able to uh, decrypt all this traffic because it has tweaked the Duffy Hellman key exchange process code. If you remember 2800, anybody remember how we used to do password recovery in 2800? We had to remove the flashcard and uh, to uh, bring the system into ROM mode and all those things, right? We had to do. It was external, right? 
Now, this was the, this is a kind of vulnerability these days. Few customers are, 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 are asking that why can't you put a container in a pen drive so that we can plug in uh, those container uh, into the USB slot which is available and do our stuff with the country, containers and all those things. We do not need to buy a separate hard disk for that. This is a vulnerability that you give an external memory slot on your router. Why? Because this is what was actually exploited. So if you have an external memory drive, anybody can plug it out. Router would not reload. Router, since it already has the image in DRAM, it won't reload. And it can plug that memory drive in, in, into the laptop and tweak the code and put the memory drive into the router again, reload the router. Router would come up with the malicious image. Right? So this is an actual attack which happened on Cisco device. It happened on 2800 and 3800 devices. How we could have uh, avoided it? With the help of signed binary and trust anchor. So signed binary images, basically it's a sign image. So we calculate hash and then we calculate digital signature for the, for the particular image. And we, for every reload, we check those things. If those things are verified, then only we load the image on our devices. Uh, now, how image knows that I am running on, a, on, a, on an authentic Cisco device? There was no way early, uh, earlier to identify that. Now we have trust anchor chips. It would be installed. It is non-volatile chip installed on the Cisco router. It would be knowing, uh, it would have information about Cisco platform. What device it is, what is its digital signature, what is its uh, you know, uh, certificate, et cetera. Those, all of them would be hard-coded into that particular trust anchor chip and it would be installed on that right router. So how, that's how the image would be knowing that I am running on right device and signed images are the way that, uh, you know, router is knowing that I am running the right image. It is not tweaked, it is not verified anywhere. Attack two. It happened around in 2013 um, uh, on 7600 devices. So what attacker did is, uh, when the iOS decompresses, it goes into DRAM, right? All the codes it go, uh, go to DRAM. And in DRAM, actually you can go, uh, what attacker did is you, uh, he logged into the device with the compromised admin credential. So that is also a very important part. You should not, you should be having a very, very tight uh, password policies in, in your network. So anyways, he accessed the device with compromised admin creden credential, and with his ways, he tweaked somehow the code which was sitting on DRAM. So it was runtime code which was already on, on DRAM. He tweaked it, and uh, he has written some line of NAT, uh, uh, NAT rules to provide access to him into the network. Also, he has... Uh, uh, he has put some filters into code so that some of the particular traffic would be redirected to attacker's intended destination. So that's how this attack was implemented. So now, we, we, in first attack, we understood that we need to know on which device we are running. This should be authentic device. Second thing what we learned is we need to know that we are running the right image. It is not tweaked, it is not changed. The third thing what we are going to uh, learn is if the image is already uploaded into the device, already in DRAM, then how we can ensure that this image is not going to be changed? If somebody changed that image itself, router is not going to reload again. So that, becomes, that also becomes an uh, important part which is called a runtime defense. Runtime defense means any, uh, nobody should be able to change the code which is running on the runtime on run time on, on, on that particular device. So for that, what we do, we have ASLR images. So to change the code, you need to know the location in the DRAM, right? So that particular location in previous iOS classic, classic iOS uh, platforms, those locations were static. Everybody knew about them. But with these ASLR images, now we do not know the location of those codes which are running. So uh, if attacker comes in and accesses some other, uh, other location in the DRAM which does not have that part of code, the router would crash. It would have spurious memory access or something like that and router would crash. 
So this is uh, this is the trust. Uh, this is the runtime def defense. What I'm talking about. It is also integrated in the Cisco boxes now. The third third attack. What uh, I'm talking about is sinful attack. Sinful attack. It happened very recently, 2015. Uh, what attacker did is did the same thing as it it has done in 2011, 12 with with 2800 devices. So it has changed the code which was sitting in Flash, and now. Uh, he was able to do command and control communication uh, with the help of TCP. Since it is TCP, that's the sinful attack. Sin is taken from a packet type of TCP. Sinful attack. So having another, again, having assigned images, et cetera, could have implemented, could have actually saved us from those, uh, this, this attack as well. So the crux of this talk is secure storage, secondary storage, Secure password, secure and signed images, and authentic hardware and runtime defense can actually prevent you from these kind of attack. And this means the trustworthy system. I did not understand what trustworthy system is, but I want a trustworthy system only in my network today. I don't want anything else. Let's move to some more comparison slides. This is just for reference. It does not have a uh, lot of things which I have not already discussed with you. But few, just for reference, you can go through it later. It talks about uh, uh, differences between ISR 890 device and ISR 1100 devices. Let's talk a little about wireless WAN. So uh, wireless WAN, uh, that means LTE feature, what we have on these devices. So you insert a SIM into the router, and the router would work as your mobile phone. Right? Uh, it will have a number. It, will, it can send SMSs. It can send data over that particular um, you know, uh, LTE interface, cellular interface, what we get. And all those capabilities are there. The main and noteworthy points here are uh, we support 300 Mbps download and 50 Mbps upload speed. We support career aggregation we talked about. And uh, third generation partnership project release 10. So partnership project is basically different telecom vendors are actually, they have, uh, they have uh, uh, made a forum and they are actually standardizing things in telecom world. So it supports release 10 of that partner partnership project. Uh, we have a Qualcomm chip to do uh, on our modem to do LTE things. And uh, you can actually have dual SIM uh, installed on the router. Auto SIM switching is there. Mobile IP, um, the mobile IP is again, uh, you know, so that you can make uh, data communication over mobile world. And you know, while your while your mobile device is roaming around, how would you ensure the IP addresses? How would you keep the same IP addresses? And all those things it talks about. So it supports PM IPv6 and. Uh, Dual uh, TDD and FDD, it is kind of how many frequencies you support. So TDD and FDD, one, uh, TDD supports one frequency, FDD two frequencies. So both supports are uh, available with these, these devices. Mobility Express, this is actually very useful uh, in branch offices basically because you are not going to buy another wireless controller. You have, bought, you have already bought this device which has access point integrated into it. Now what if you want, you want to purchase more access point? Who would, who would uh, uh, control these two access points uh, you know, while people are roaming around your access point, between the access point region and all those things. So you are not going to buy another wireless uh, controller for, to manage that. This device has the Mobility Express integrated into that particular access point which is sitting on the device. So it can work as an access point or it can work as a wireless controller, all right? So, uh, the access point it integ is integrated into the router. It is not visible or there is no pluggable module coming in for access point. It is integrated into the router. And uh, the access point, what it has is if you are aware of Cisco Aeronet uh, uh, a wireless access point, it has uh, 1851i Aeronet access point integrated into it. A very simple and easy setup. Within 10 or 15 minutes, you should be able to do it. It can manage up to 50 access points in, uh, with, with all these different releases and uh, you know, models. 
It supports 802.11 AC, we have already talked about. And the most important thing is it's free of, I mean, not, I wouldn't say it is free of cost because you are buying the device, but you do not need an extra license to run it. It comes with the device. For the wireless LAN, uh, you can stop me for any questions if you have, okay? So wireless LAN, uh, we have this access point integrated into it, which has four antenna, internal antennas, and it supports dual radio. And uh, it has one, one GBPS link which is going towards the switching, uh, towards the switching module and one, one GBPS link which is going towards the CPU of the router. Uh, it supports multiple uh, user MIMO. This is, this is uh, something we already talked about, 802.11 wave two. So it can actually serve all the connected devices at a single time slice. You don't need to wait for your time slice to get served. Maximum throughput you can get is seven, uh, 870 Mbps. The important thing uh, here is to note this particular connection. So if somebody is connected with your LAN, uh, the LAN switch which is there on these devices, and if somebody is connected with your wireless access point, they have a dedicated interface to talk. So that data doesn't need to go through the data plane of the router. What it means is, if it is not going through the data pl plane of the router, it is not attributing to the throughput of the device. So uh, you can have one GBPS communication between switching module and the access point. Still, you have those 350 Mbps left on that device to run crypto. So it is not attributing to the throughput of the device. It has dedicated communication channel. Uh, it provides con console access via the router console itself. You can go to hardware module session and all those things. And uh, yeah, one GBPS uplink, uh, up uplink connection to, to, towards the CPU. This is how we are going to set up Mobility Express on these devices. This is very easy. You just power on the device, you connect to Air Cisco Air Provision SSID, and log into one of the uh, log in to, to the link. This is, this is pre-configured link and everything. You would have access to this particular link. You log into it, you run through the wizard, and you are good to go. Cisco access point would be working. If you bring up another access point in the same layer two domain, it would join as a subord subordinate access point. So this is how, this is how it is, uh, you know, it's very simple to implement and work with. All right, Cisco Network Intuitive. Why exactly I'm talking about it here is uh, because ISR, with ISR 1100 devices also, you get a lot of network intuitive. I mean, I would say all the network intuitive features what Cisco today ha has. So uh, network intuitive, if uh, you have not attended any session about network intuitive, a little I talk about it is suppose nowadays things are getting more genuine. Nowadays, things are getting more obvious. So if I need, if I'm a businessman and I need this particular intent, suppose I'm very particular about my conferences. So if I need my conferences to run without any particular glitch, I need that. I don't want my IT guy coming to me and explaining to me that uh, you know, probably our quality of service implementation is not fine. This is the reason we, we could not do it this time. We are working on it and we'll fix it in future. You know, this is very vague answer. I'm not looking for it, right? And that is how it happens with the customer. Not all the customers are technical enough to understand it and we don't expect it. We don't customers to be technical, um, you know, to be technical expert on everything, each and everything what we have, and we don't expect them to understand what, what our problems are. Our problems are our problem, we need to solve it. That is how we are going to evolve, and that is what it ha is happening with Network Intuitive. You just tell me your business intention, I should be able to train my system so that I do not need any manual intervention or any manual excuses to tell you next time that this is the problem, that's why we, we were not able to achieve it. I, my system, I have trained it, and it is able to tweak itself, it is able to configure itself, it is able to run itself, 
as per your business intent. And that is how it is happening with all these integration. So you have ISR 1100 sitting there. You have DNS Center sitting there. The DNS Center is continuously learning information uh, performances from ISR 1100 or, or, or all the devices which are, which are sitting in the network. And it is checking if this is the, this is uh, validating or this is fulfilling the business need that customer has. If it does not have, uh, full, if it is not fulfilling it, I am going to change the policies in the network. No manual, manual intervention required, just one-time configuration, and you would be able to achieve your market need. All right. With this, uh, I would, uh, you know, a little about platform as well. We, we have talked a lot lot of things about uh, you know technologies what we are integrating into it but this is the platform what we are going to uh, give to you this is uh, most of the things i have already talked about multi core architecture it is fanless device not lot of heat generating so fan is not required actually uh, it uh, comes with four port or eight port gigabit ethernet switches and dsl lte's i already talked about it Let's go to go and see the device. This is the naming convention what we are following. So uh, C is standard prefix what we associate with Cisco devices. 1111 means the last one what you are seeing here. Actually, it means that two gigabit Ethernet WAN port is available on that device. If uh, you see two there or if you see three there, that means different. That means something different. Probably it has one gigabit Ethernet, one DSL, or something like that. So before buying it, you need to actually choose the device wisely. 8, 8P means eight LAN ports are available there. LTEA means it has LTE support for Europe, America, Canada, and Middle East region. So your region-wise, you need to select the device. And these are the few more uh, information about it. So you can see that if it has two, it has one. Uh, if it has two written there, then it has one gigabit Ethernet interface, WAN interface, and one DSL interface, which is support, supporting GFAST, VDSL, and all those things. So as per requirement, you can choose uh, from the whole portfolio. So there are like. 50 different options, lots and lots of options are there in this particular portfolio. So there are more than 50 different devices you, which uh, you can choose from, like this. And there is another uh, platform that we have. It is pluggable platform, basically. So if you do not need LTE today, probably you need it tomorrow. For a year, you can run without LTE. And after a year, you can buy that pluggable module, plug it in, and you know, run with LT. This is the front panel of the device. It has nice illuminated Cisco logo in front of it. Um, it's a fun fact, but you know, uh, I think I can talk about it here. So uh, I think uh, somewhere, somewhere I heard that we have given the contract to same company to design this device externally, uh, which has designed Mercedes. So same company has designed, so it is a very sophisticated and uh, you know, good-looking device in your data center. It has few LEDs to tell you about basic operation, uh, like VPN, power, LTE, um, you know, RSSI signals, and all those things. This is the back panel of the device. You can guess that this is 1111 device because it has two WAN ports into it, right? Here. These two WAN ports are there. And also there is one combo SFP for one of the WAN port. So if you want to use that, uh, use SFPs in your network, you can use that as well. It gives you that kind of uh, you know, capability. And this metal cover, uh, inside this you can put two SIM cards. Dual SIM slots are there. If you, uh, if you uh, uncover that steel uh, part of it, you would see two SIM card slots are available. You can actually uh, have SIMs in installed into it. This Kensington slot is also available with this device. You can lock it. Security is becoming more relevant these days. It has been always, but people are, talk about, people are talking about security more. So that's why I just wanted to tell you that this slot is also, you know, you can use it to lock devices. Just like in your laptop, it was coming earlier. 
This is four port switch, uh, four port device, and this also has all of them exactly same. Uh, just one thing, it has DSL port here. All right. So different portfolios, actually, you can, you can choose as per your need. Different devices uh, are available. Some 50 more options are there. You can choose from them. Uh, this is another variant of it, 11014 port. So it is a very compact for probably for some small pizza places, coffee places, or something like that. It comes in three variants. These three variants are there. Uh, one is 11014 port, which is compact form factor. Another comes with pluggable. So you have, a, 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 uh, you have options to plug LTE device into it, LTE uh, module into it, then you would have um, you know, uh, SIM support and all those things you can do. The third variant comes with wireless access point as well. So this is very compact, but very feature -rich device, rich device as well. This is the back panel for the same device. You can see that. Uh, it is this. This is the module which have in, uh, which we have installed later part. This is another machine-to-machine -machine communication model. If you uh, are aware of, so this is one one zero nine four port LTE uh, with two pluggables, and uh, uh, you can see that there are three different uh, three different models are available for that. One one zero nine two port LTE and a 11094 port LT with two pluggables and the wireless module. The important thing to notice here is the uh, temperature range it can work on. So it can go from minus 15 to 55 degrees Celsius. And uh, for the first one, it can go up to zero, from zero to 50 degrees Celsius. Not all the devices are supporting this kind of temperature range. This is a machine-to-machine -machine, uh, you know, solution for machine-to-machine -machine solutions. That's the reason uh, it is like that. These are the pluggable modules which you can insert into it. And you should be good to go with the, uh, uh, with the LTE feature. Some performance specs. Uh, this I, I understand this is very important to understand that uh, how much uh, understand for a customer that how much performance I'm going to get from the devices with the growing trend of traffic that we see in our networks these days. So uh, with the plane traffic, uh, as I already discussed, that a, a four port uh, four port device gives you around 1.2 Gbps of plane text. Uh, I mean without crypto, it is unthrottled. It comes with the device. You don't need to buy any license for that. So if you're not running any crypto, you can go up to 1.2 Gbps. Of course, depends on different feature. If you are in, uh, not running crypto, but you're running quality of service, NAT, NetFlow, NVAR, et cetera, then it can further come down. But, but with not, uh, without any features on, uh, features on the device, you can go up to 1.2 Gbps of the platform throughput. And with 8P devices, you can go up to 1.7 Gbps of the throughput. Crypto traffic, by default, it is 50 Mbps flat. And there is a shaper, which you can remove with the help of a license, pay-as-you-grow model license. So there, uh, there are performance licenses which you can install on this device, and it, will, it can go up to 150 Mbps or 250 Mbps in, in case of uh, 8 port model. And if you have HSEC K9 license, with the HSEC K9 license, you can actually go even beyond that. So in some parts, I have seen that customer is getting around 330, 335 Mbps with the uh, 8 port variant of it. Few more uh, performance specs. I think I have already talked about this, but with some kind of IMX, IMX traffic and some kind of uh, you know, features, what exactly we are getting, you can uh, just keep it as a reference. Yes. Uh, data sheet, it is not available, but you can get it um, you know, with the sales guys or uh, probably Cisco Sales Connect. Uh, on the on the device on the Cisco ISR 1100 uh, product page, there are few PPTs like this. It is available, but uh, in all the presentations and all people are talking about it, so you would get this information. 
Oh, I see. OK, OK. So um, if you are not getting any of the official document, probably you can talk to your account manager. He should be able to provide it with, for you. But these are internal testings, basically. What you basically need to know is uh, it has up to 350 Mbps uh, uh, support with the HSEC K9 license. And with the plane traffic, it can go up to 1.7. Yeah, please. HSEC K9. So yeah, without HSEC K9, so HSEC K9 and performance licenses are two things. So on, to have crypto features, you need to have security license, first of all. Over security license, if you are not having HSEC K9 or performance licenses, then you would get up to 50 Mbps of the uh, crypto throughput. If you buy a performance license, so uh, you can get up to 250 Mbps with the eight port device. And if you buy HSEC K9 license, so at, for HSEC K9 license, performance li license is not a requirement. So you can buy either of them. So if you buy a sec K9 license, you can get up to 350 Mbps. It is unthrottled. Whatever uh, limit till a device can support, it can go up to that. So around 350 Mbps it has been seen. Yeah. Uh, performance of these small, small versions you are talking about? Yeah, so these are also known for the exact same performance capability. For? Four port model. Yeah, so you can, you can expect the same kind of performance with those devices also. So it is for complete portfolio. OK? I think there is something. All right. Yeah, this is hardware diagram. Uh, for the device. Uh, so we have actually four core SOC. Uh, one, co uh, I mean, uh, one core is dedicated for control plane pro processing, and there are two different cores sitting there just doing data plane processing. And one core is there for future use. There is a dedicated crypt crypto engine sitting there on the SOC, which is doing encryption, decryption, and hash related functions. Apart from that, uh, you can see here this link I was talking about. So any traffic coming from wireless access point and going to the ethernet switch doesn't need to go through the data plane of the device. So it does not attribute to, to uh, you know, device crypto throughput. Uh, this is the link which is making the difference between four port and eight port. So for four port, it is one GBPS, and for eight port, it is 2.5 GBPS link, which is going from ethernet switch to the uh, device uh, CPU. Data plane, basically. Yeah, this is the licensing model I was talking about. So by default, you just get IP-based licenses, right? And uh, with universal K9 license model, if you know all the features are there in universal K9 images, you just need to, uh, you need to enable them with the help of licenses. So uh, with application, uh, you can uh, have IP base. By default, it is coming with the device. Over on top of it, you can have application experience license or security licenses. And once you have security license, security license is prerequisite for IP security or it's a K9 license. So over on top of security, uh, security K9 license, you can have IP security performance or SSEC K9 license. Depends in your country. Few countries actually, they do not support unthrottled crypto. So here, SSEC K9 basically gives you, there is no shaper at all there. So uh, if your country supports it, you can basically go for SSEC K9 license as well. Cisco Smart Licensing, uh, it has support for that. Uh, on top of it, it has also support for um, you know, Cisco One License Integration. It will give you uh, the investment production part of it. There are different packages, license packages. So uh, this is just for your understanding. There's nothing uh, like package which you can purchase to, for these particular features only. Uh, the licenses which are available are just Apex and Security K9 licenses, but yeah. Uh, for uh, which feature to run, which, feature, uh, which particular license to use. So this is just for your reference for that part. 
Uh, this is how we are going to enable. Once we have the license with us, you can, uh, if you are uh, familiar with ISR 4000 devices, we used to go into the uh, config mode and configure hardware throughput limit on all those things. It is exactly same. Once you have the license installed, you can put this command line there, platform hardware throughput crypto limit, and reload the device. You should have uh, an enhanced, uh, enhanced, license, uh, enhanced performance on the device. Apart from that, this is you know, the new unthrottled command, which was introduced in 16.7.1. And uh, it gives you a capability to enable HSEC-K9 license on the device. All right. Any other questions here? I'll move to software overview now. So if you have any other questions, or probably you can also use WebEx team to discuss about the questions. So in general, FPGAs are used for, suppose, uh, ASICs and the software uh, and the uh, you know, integrated circuit, what we have today on our devices. Those would not be able to uh, run everything. Suppose with down the line, you need to integrate something which, which needed to go on hardware, but your hardware is not that customizable enough that we can put it on that now. Right? So for those reasons, we have these programmable ASICs on our devices that suppose some feature which needed some hardware support and it needs to be integrated with our devices, will, we should be able to do that. So this is what it is doing. Basically for now, uh, it should be doing some uh, I.O. related driver, uh, you know, I.O. driver installation and control, all, all those things. Normally it does that, but uh, this is also intended for those uses. Okay. For the software architecture, yeah, uh, if you are aware of iOS XE platform architecture, it is exactly same. So everything is modular. Your data plane is modular. Your control plane is modular. Your I.O. plane is also modular. And all these mo different modules are talking with each other with the help of Linux control messaging. So basically, we are containing the fault domain. Also, it is providing a little bit security, because if somebody has gotten access to, uh, suppose, forwarding engine driver, Right, So it has a dedicated memory space which it can talk to. If it is going beyond that, then definitely the router would crash. So that, that is some kind of illegal memory access and those things. So it also gives us secure, some security features. Uh, it, this is now in all iOS XE platform. And uh, these IOSD image, what you are seeing here, this is IOSD. It is just working as an application on the device, on the Linux device. It is IOS daemon, basically. All right, so we'll go to a few. Uh, I, would, I would touch upon a little uh, about, the, uh, about the troubleshooting experiences or troubleshooting on these devices. So this devices, device, you can divide it in different uh, different regions like IO plane, data plane, and the control plane, and the crypto plane. So data comes into IO plane, it goes to data plane, and then, you know, if uh, it does not need to go to CPU, it, does not, it, uh, it doesn't go to CPU, and it goes out of the IO plane from the data plane itself. So from IO plane perspective, our, our, all the legacy commands, what we had, like show interfaces, show interface summary, and all those things are there. The command which I would like to talk about is this one. Show platform hardware subslot backplane statistics. So we talked about this link, right? I'm sorry. We talked about this link. The Ethernet switch link, which was of 1 Gbps and 2.5 Gbps for eight port devices. So this link is basically connecting the Ethernet switch with the core, uh, with the CPU core. So this is the command which gives you capability to understand what is happening on that particular core, because it is possible that everything is fine with those interfaces where you have devices connected, plugged into it. But uh, there can be issues with this particular link. Probably it is oversubscribed or something like that, which you need to find out with, this, with the help of this command. Packet flow. 
when it goes to the data plane, you have lots and lots of capability to, uh, in the data plane. If you are aware of ASR 1000, they had a quantum flow processor. Quantum flow processor is nothing but it is doing all the data plane related tasks. So most of the tasks which were earlier done by CPU is now offloaded to quantum flow processes on ASR devices. Exactly same here also, this quantum flow processor is not a chip here, but uh, you know, we have coded quantum flow processes on the, those two cores that we have. So uh, you can actually run few uh, QFP related commands like statistics drop, like if it is getting punted to the CPU from the data plane, you can see that here. I mean, uh, if any kind of drop is happening while punting the data to the CPU, you can check it here. And similarly, for uh, every particular interface, whatever data is coming into the, con um, uh, you know, from I/O plane to control plane, it is, it is, uh, it can be seen with these commands. Once data reaches uh, data, uh, once the packet reaches data plane, it can either go to crypto assist engine or it can go to the CPU. Right? If it needs to uh, perform some crypto-related thing, it goes to the crypto assist engine, like encryption, decryption, hashing, et cetera, if you, you have enabled on your device. If not, then it goes to CPU. Uh, not every packet goes to CPU. Suppose some control packet you have, which needs to go to CPU, it goes to CPU and get processed, and then again come back to, this, uh, to the data plane. Now, data plane is only able to send the traffic out of the devices. CPU cannot send it directly. So uh, while the traffic is getting punted and received via uh, CP, uh, uh, control plane and sent out via control plane, you can see those stats as well. Once all of these things are done, data is getting out of the device. Some health, um, you know, hardware health check related things, you might be already aware of it if you are using uh, Cisco iOS XC platform. Show platform would give you information about all the modules since when it is running. If it is not running, then what is the issue? Probably it is unknown state, out of service state, or, you know, it's booting state or whatever state it can be. So you can get a nice view of the overall device operating with show platform command. Show facility alarm status command, it also tells you about the, all the modules which are inserted to the routers and what are the state, if there is anything gone wrong critically with those modules, it tells you about that as well. Uh, control processor brief tells you about the each and every processes and memories which are in different modules of the devices. It tells you information about that. And platform diag also, similar thing. You know, it tells you more detail about a particular module since when it is up and all those things. What is the software, hardware it is running. Health check for the data plane. Again, I said that QFP is integrated part of the data plane, so that is what uh, we are checking uh, the health about. So uh, show, platform, uh, show platform hardware QFP active statistics drops is a very, very useful command in TAC. We always use this command as a first sign of indication of any particular issue. You would be able to understand if any drop or any kind of latency you are seeing in the network. QFP has the features, few of them I'll talk about it. To, to give you that level of information that uh, if any particular feature is taking time to process a, part, process a particular packet. QF, from QFP packet captures, you can actually uh, get to know that. Uh, probably, uh, you know, some feature is not processing the packet. How would you know in iOS classic, classic iOS devices? You would not be knowing if any particular feature is not processing the packet. You would be able to know with the help of QFP related commands here. There is a very, a very nice session uh, on iOS XC troubleshooting. If you want, and uh, go and join it. This is very useful session. It is presented by one of our DSEs, Distinguished Services Engineer. So he has been doing it for a long time. So you can find this session in Cisco On Demand li Library as well. I would recommend, if you are using Cisco iOS XC device, I would recommend to go through this session, at least this session. This has a lot of information into it about iOS XE devices. I have the slides there also. You can actually download it. So uh, all right. So uh, coming to packet capture tools here, all right? So uh, uh, 
if you want to come here, there are a few seats available. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is there. Even this side, a lot of seats are there. So packet capture tool. There are basically two packet capture tool I would like to talk about is one is packet trace. How many of us has used packet trace already? Anybody use? You used it? OK, excellent. So few of them, are, a few of us have already used, so we must be knowing the capability of this tool. This is not just a packet capture tool. It is also a debugger for you. So it tells you initially, earlier you used to run debugging commands and all those things. Now there are conditional debugs integrated into these devices. It is uh, the packet trace. It is a debugger plus packet capture tool which can actually go to, with the help of FIA trace, feature invocation array trace, it can go up to the level of feature processing of a packet and can tell you if that particular feature is processing the packet or not. Probably you are you know, troubleshooting internet connectiv connectivity issues, like your end users are not able to reach to the internet. What is happening with them? Is NAT not working? Is IPsec not working? What is not working? So you can actually uh, do this kind of debugging, packet trace debugging, and try to identify that if it is getting natted, if it is getting uh, encrypted or not. Uh, these are the simple snippets I have captured from few of the uh, packet traces which I, have, I did. So in one, one of them, the NAT was happening. You can see this uh, source was getting translated from old IP address to new IP address. In crypto, you can see that encryption was happening with these peers in the network. All right? These are the commands you can enable on the device to run the packet trace. It is, uh, customers normally ask that if it is CPU intensive, it is, if it is going to cause any, uh, any trouble to my device because, because it's a production device. So I have been running this since last three and a half years in my TAC career. I never seen a single device crashing while, while, or even CPU is running high, or even memory is running high. I have not seen a single device getting into trouble because of this particular feature. And believe me, I handle three, four cases each day. So I do not see any of the devices running into this particular issue, any day. This is, again, another packet capture tool. The best thing about this tool is, uh, uh, you know, it is called EPC, Embedded Packet Capture. It comes with the device. The best thing about this particular tool is that you can export the captures in the form of P uh, in, in the form of PCAP format. So, and you can download it and open it in Wireshark. In packet trace, we do not have capability as of now while we are talking, but you can still copy those hex values and go to any of the uh, you know, web uh, tool and put those hex value and get the get it uh, converted to PCAP format. That gives you uh, it gives you that capability. But with this particular capture tool, you can actually export the captures into PCAP format and down uh, you know and open it in Wireshark and all those things. This is very useful. All right. Uh, again, another session update. Uh, one of our technical lead is doing this particular session. It only talk about, talks about packet captures in the network on different devices, like switching devices, like iOS XE devices. He has varied different you know, experiences and uh, uh, you know, devices on which we can take packet capture in Cisco. So he has a lot of information in this particular tool. He also has been doing the session since long time now. You can go to Cisco On Demand Library and look for this session. You would, you would get it, the previous session also. OK? Yes, please. Uh, you can do FTP export. So the question is if uh, we can use other means to export the devices, like here it is, I'm using TFTP. Uh, export the packet capture. Here I'm using TFTP. We can use FTP. We can uh, send, export it to boot flash, then download it via USB. Any, uh, all means are available. All right? Great. So web UI interface. I uh, see that nobody has been using web UI interface on this device. Configuration is very simple. And you can look at the interface that it gives. You know, uh, as you log into the device, just put, uh, you, once you configure web UI on the device, there are three, four commands for that. And put the IP address of your uh, router in the, uh, in the URL, web URL. You get this kind of inf interface, which is shown here. It talks about 
information, uh, it, ha it has pulled the information from the device, like memory and CPU utilization, et cetera. And it tells you nice view of the device monitoring. Apart from that, there are a lot of interfaces available, like the one which is sitting here. It is a troubleshooting tab. So in this troubleshooting tab, suppose TAC asked you for, for show tech. They, they ask all the time, whatever be the issue, whatever be the issue, and whatever they are trying to troubleshoot, but they ask for show tech. There are different reasons for that, but I won't go in detail about those, those reasons. My point is that if TAC asks lots and lots of data, how would you do that? Probably you do not have access to the CLI of the device. Probably you, wouldn't, you are not able to, you know, uh, you don't know the commands to download, et cetera, a lot, lot of things there. So you can actually make a debug bundle here. Here I have made a debug bundle with show run, show platform. I can include a core dump file. If the router crashes, it would have a core dump file. I can make a debug, debug bundle out of it and send it to TAC. You should be able to download that debug bundle and send it to TAC. It has become so easy these days. Apart from that, some device configuration related information like and uh, you know uh, all kind of uh, uh, runtime information about all the interfaces you should be able to see it not only that it also gives you some troubleshooting capabilities like this you can ping and trace it would tell you where exactly it is breaking breaking down and all those things and on top of that suppose this was a particular communication i have actually Anybody has used AVC in, in, in their network? Application visibility and control? You, you are using it, right? So you know the capability of it. So you can actually go ahead and AVC, you can configure via this tool, or, uh, this tool within you know, three or four clicks, it should be able to do it. Since you are using it, you know how, much, how many lines of configuration and all those things you require to do it, to, to enable it on device. In two or three clicks, you can configure AVC with the help of Web UI, and it gives you nice, you know, uh, uh, look of the traffic monitoring from the device. Here you can see that 50, 50, uh, um, you know, 71 percent of usage is just via Facebook.com, and you know, 16 percent was ping. So this was my lab device where I had an IPSLA configured for Facebook.com, uh, and so that is that is why it was capturing all these things. <laughs> There are a lot of troubleshooting options available there. You can get audit support or uh, you know, web server logs and all those things. Core dump analysis is also coming a part of it. So if you are aware of Cisco Diagnostic Bridge, so it is the tools and servers which Cisco is trying to make available to customers so that they can analyze their network by themselves. So uh, that support is also coming with it. Uh, this is just you know, two, two, four, one, five. Five lines of configuration, and you should be up and running with Web UI. It is very easy, but very useful. Now, recently, with the 16.10, you can configure OSPF, EIGRP was already there, and lots of lot of features which we are uh, integrating with this particular interface. So I encourage you all to use it. All right. Okay. So I am moving to the next section of the slides. Do you have any questions by now? Yes, please. Different logins? Uh, yes. Uh, for Web UI? Yeah, yeah, you can actually. So here in this case, the question is, is it possible to use different login creden credential for the Web UI? Yes. Here I, I had a local database created for it and I was using it, you can redirect it to TechX or something like that. So that also is available. All right, let's go to solution and feature overviews, although it supports lots of solution and it has a lot of nitty gritties to talk about, but I would not go in detail. I would just tell you the features and solution it supports. First of all, I would like to talk about SD-WAN. So recently we have got the support for SD-WAN on this device. And uh, ISR 1K devices are basically sitting at the edge here. 
And once you, I was talking about that bartender experience of mine, right? He was talking, he was saying that I don't know why Cisco has started making those complicated devices when it had some modems which we can just plug in and, uh, you know, it can come up. <laughs> so that experience we can get in SD-WAN. You just plug in your device, you just need an IP address which, are, which you are receiving from, uh, from the ISP you, uh, via DHCP. Once you get that particular IP address, your device, you don't need to touch it, your device would reach to Cisco Cloud PNP servers. Uh, PNP is another part of uh, this Cisco Cloud, uh, this SD-WAN in, uh, integration. So it would reach to PNP site. It would get the IP address of vBond. vBond is, vBond is another part of SD-WAN which tells you about your vManage and vSmart. So vManage is the component which configures SD-WAN. vSmart is the con uh, com uh, component which actually is the brain of SD-WAN. So it does all the, config, uh, all the routing related or policy related uh, things, uh, vSmart. So once you go uh, to the uh, PNP and uh, the PNP would tell you about your vBond. vBond, uh, once you reach to vBond, vBond would tell you about the vSmart and vManage. You go to vManage to download the configuration. Once the configuration is done, you go, you go, to, uh, you go and start making peering with the vSmart. Once you have those peering enabled, up and running, you are into SD-WAN fabric. There is no human intervention required at all. So now it all making sense to me because it gives the ease of implementation. Suppose gentleman had 1,000 devices in his network. Suppose I need to integrate 1,000 SD-WAN endpoints. How would I do that? I, I would need months and months of time to configure it manually. But it is not needed anymore now. VXLAN support. Suppose you don't want to use SD-WAN anymore. You don't want to, you know, um, you don't have uh, infrastructure because in SD-WAN everything is not supported as of now. It is coming in phases. So. Uh, Suppose you don't want to use it. Now, for a branch, you're not going to buy a, an MPLS link to get a better performance, right, fast performance. So you would look for something which is like, uh, which is going to extend your L2 domain to other sites. So that capability is given with 16.9.1 VXLAN. If you are aware of VXLAN, it extends the uh, layer 2 domain between the sites. You don't need MPLS, but you get uh, that kind of support, that kind of you know, capability here as well. If you are aware of OTB, it is exactly, sim uh, not exactly, it has better control in traffic with the help of EBP and BGP, et cetera. But uh, with 16.9.1, we have integrated VXLAN with this box as well. And it is also with ISR 4K, just for your information. All right, this is the interesting part. Encrypted traffic analysis. Is anybody using ETA in their network right now? No, right? Okay, so why it is important? Because malware doesn't come in plain text all the time. So your, uh, your uh, firewall uh, may be not able to identify the malware which is getting into your network right now because it is coming as encrypted traffic, right? So you need to understand, there, is a, there has been a way to identify that, like you had to decrypt all the traffic, then then check it and then encrypt it and then again send it. Kind of man in the middle you can have there. But that is not very efficient way, correct? So, and nobody wants, once the traffic is uh, getting in encrypted by me, I don't want anybody is decrypting it through the path and then again encrypting it and send it. It is not very efficient way, but people are using this, people have been using this in very secure environment. What encrypted traffic analysis is, uh, is doing here is, this is the new, again, innovation with the Cisco. Uh, suppose all the arrow pointing above is client to server communication, and all the arrows pointing downwards is server to client communication, okay? Then look at this particular uh, graph. What is, it is happening here is a simple Google search, all right? So all the above arrow, suppose I am the, I am the person doing Google search, what I do is google.com, right? And then the page downloads. Then I start typing something like football. So uh, if, I, if I type foot, 
it would give me uh, auto correct uh, i mean it would suggest me that it can be football right uh, it can be anything footwear or anything like that so few information is coming again from the uh, from yeah few information are coming again from the uh, from the google search to me so all the uh, all the lines which you are seeing above the flat line horizontal line it is the communication between client to server and everything down is the server to client so google is sending me lots and lot, lots of data first of all i am downloading the google.com page then i am typing for something then i am going to page refresh right the uh, the intended page opens so this is a legitimate signature this is the legitimate signature of a communication initial page load key strokes i was typing something and sending it to google google was suggesting me some few things and then auto complete is the same thing google is suggesting me something and i you know suggesting for the auto completion i click on something and then again page refresh happens this is a legitimate signature of a legitimate communication simple google search but now look at this this was best of era trojan what we are talking about and here if you see the pattern of the communication so i have you know shared my signed certificate and after that we see huge number of data going out from the client to server right <clears throat> this signature doesn't look legitimate and this is a kind of signature that we are using in our eta traffic analysis so what we are doing is once the traffic is encrypted we are not decrypting it anymore it's not needed while the session is getting established what kind of packet is flowing from client to server from uh, from uh, server to client and what were the initial exchange while the traffic was not encrypted we actually capture that and make these kind of signatures what you see here this kind of signature for legitimate this kind of signature for illegitimate and try to identify the malware this is very interesting technology and it is uh, if, you, if you all understand that it is doable but doing it at the scale that it gives 99.99% of accuracy it's not easy thing to do it requires lot of man force it requires lot of research it requires lot of data collection and analysis happening millions and millions of you know uh, calculations and everything is running at every second in cisco to identify to make it 99.9% accurate all right interesting right it has been very interesting for me yeah yes yeah so cisco basically um, with the help of stealth watch if you are aware of it i wanted to talk about it uh, stealth watch here so it's a, again you had scan safe right so uh, it's again uh, uh, something like that it's a cloud uh, platform cisco stealth watch once it identifies it it has policies to block it it has policies to inform you that malware has been identified in your network and it has been blocked you can go and try to tweak it if it is false positive you can try to tweak it if it is not false positive you know uh, it is blocked in your network so that is the intention i'm just identifying it is not an intention to enforcing the pol policy over it is the intention for our for our network yeah you need stealth watch you need stealth stealth watch integration so basically what router does is once you have these configurations enabled you put a flow record destination ip address here which can be stealth watch ip address and the data would be sent this initial signatures would be taken out from the config, uh, from the communication and sent to the stealth watch cloud now stealth watch cloud is making the decision that it is a legitimate or not if it is not legitimate it would be stopped there so router is just intercepting it intercepting it and sending it to a stealth watch uh, i'm sorry sorry i didn't get that yeah yeah so it is just a intercepting device there sitting there and for that you need this kind of configurations and once you have it configured you can again this is happening in data plane so you can run qfp command to try and identify what is happening with the network if it is working or not 
Okay, another interesting part. How many of you are aware of an attack which is called DNS tunneling attack? Right? It's, it's, it's very, I mean, it's very frequent. If you, if you know, even a person, uh, you know, which does not know a lot about networking or computer world or uh, security, he can just download a free software and run a DNS tunneling attack where he doesn't need to authenticate or he can actually pass through your network devices without even, even getting recognized. How does it happen? Basically, for all the communication, what happens first is uh, DNS gets resolved, right? And for, the, uh, for DNS resolution, there are DNS packets. Now, what if I put my HTTP packet inside DNS packet? Nobody is going to look for the layer seven unless you have ALG enable and all those things. But if for ALG also, you need to have the filtering, those kind of filtering enabled on the device, which not all the devices are capable to do. So you can put your HTTP com communication inside the DNS, and for if you ask me the use case, suppose uh, guest login, Wi-Fi guest login, uh, login is there. I don't need to log in to guest to get the internet access. With DNS tunneling, with uh, tools, very simple tools like VPN over DNS, like DNS CAD, DNS2, TCP, IODIN, these tools are giving me the capability to establish a DNS tunneling uh, tunneling uh, with the server, or they have their actually servers installed in cloud, where you go, they strip off the DNS and send the packet to your HTTP server, like Facebook or whatever you want to browse. And then again, the packet is coming to cloud. They are putting DNS headers back so that your router or firewall would not be able to recognize while the traffic is coming backwards. You know, the response is coming backwards. So that's how serious this attack is. And the worst part is you don't need much expertise to implement it. So every now and then people have been doing, you have been seen doing this kind of attack. Now, what do we need to, to mitigate this? What, do, what exactly do we need to, you know, uh, come over this particular attack or mitigate this particular attack is something which is happening at DNS level. level. Your router should be able to identify if something is wrong at DNS level itself. So that is via the umbrella branch. Umbrella branch is again Cisco cloud-based uh, platform. So uh, whenever a DNS request is coming in, uh, also I forgot to tell you about few well-known attacks. There, there are uh, many attacks, but three or four only, I have covered it here. You can learn more uh, about DNS tunneling and all those things in the link which is given there. So this is Cisco Umbrella Branch. What it does is it intercepts your DNS requests. So as your DNS request comes to ISR 1100 router, it would be first sent to Umbrella. Now Umbrella would be seeing that DNS packet and on the basis of reputation-based filtering, on the basis of static filtering, and on the basis of malware detection methods and all those things, it identifies that if this is a malicious attempt to access the network or not. If it is, it has been identified something like that, then that would be blocked. Your, that DNS required, request would not go, uh, would not have any answer for it. So it is basically, there are three categories here, whitelist, blacklist, and gray, gray list. So if I'm blacklisting that particular communication, that means it is not, uh, that communication would not uh, complete. You won't get the DNS response, basically. Uh, if I'm blacklisting it, then, uh, yeah, if I'm blacklisting it, that would not, would not co uh, complete. If I'm whitelisting it, that's a good communication. Gray list, I'm sending that data again to some of the, you know, intelligent proxy in the network. That would do further checks and then uh, try to identify if it is a legitimate communication or not. Now, problem with this attack is, problem with this solution is, what if I'm using IP addresses? Right? I am not doing DNS. What if I am using IP addresses directly? So at least in DNS tunneling, like use case, uh, like uh, uh, you know, guest access, etc., you would not be able to access it. But for IP, if if somebody is using IP for that kind of attack, there is no solution as of now. People are working on it, but there is no solution. I'm sorry, you're not audible.
Uh, I'm really sorry. Your voice is not very clear. Uh, anybody heard it uh, in the front row? It is not very clear. Uh, would you mind if you put the question there? And uh, if, if you have a question, would you mind? I'm sorry for that. It is not audible till here. So. All right. So this is all about the umbrella architecture. And this is, uh, you know, a few of the comparisons between umbrella uh, from 800 devices and 1,100 devices. With this, I think I'm almost done. There are a few references for you guys. You know, what features we have and uh, what different kind of licenses we require for that particular feature to run. Uh, you can go through these slides once you have time, uh, you know, whenever you are implementing. What we are offering with SD-WAN, what are the features that we are offering with SD-WAN? And what is supported today, what is not supported, uh, I have further three slides for that. And there are a few references from where I, which has helped me to prepare this PPT. That is all from my side. The key takeaway, uh, you know, it's, it's, I would say it's all about performance, all about security, all about future, right? These three things, actually, we are ensuring in this particular device. This is a very handy device to have, have at a branch site. And this is going for a long way. It is, you know, it has a lot of capabilities. And we are investing a lot in this device. So this, this was my agenda. I think I have completed everything. I just have four minutes. If you have any other question, uh, please let me know. You can actually put the question. I'm really sorry for that. It is, it is a small room, but we should have got a mic. Oh, this is there. It is working. Would you like to try? <laughs> yeah. So it was around the DNS interception the yes. umbrella is based around. So at the moment, there is a bit of a move towards uh, DNS over TLS. Mm -hmm. There's quite a few of the big uh, DNS providers offering that. Does it feel like a bit of an uphill battle to try and protect against uh, these sorts of things using those methods? Yeah, so DNS over TLS is, again, another solution for that. You can do it. I was talking about Umbrella because it has the integration with ISR 1100. So that, that, that was the intention, basically. It, has, uh, it is supported in this device, so this is a kind of solution which I ha had to discuss. Does it answer? Yeah. OK, all right. Thank you. Any other questions, gentlemen? No? Yes, please. Oh, I see. OK. Uh, you would have to tell me the specifics on it. If uh, You have raised the Cisco case for that, right? Yeah, there was some announcement from Cisco that some uh, serious products huh. with uh, field, anal uh, field, field notice you are talking about, right? Can you paste that field notice in the Cisco WebEx Teams? I do not have it on top of my mind, but I, I can get you the answer for that, if that is fixed or not. Sure, sure. So uh, I would really request you to put the field notice in the WebEx teams. I'll read through it and uh, we'll check internally if there has been any enhancements to it or not. All right, if uh, we do not have any questions, I would request you to fill your session eval evaluation survey. Uh, there are a few goodies with that, I think. I'm not aware of it. I never did that. But with four session surveys and overall completion survey, you will get a Cisco t-shirt. That is not the intention, though. I mean, I would need to hear from you how, do, how did you like, a, uh, what did you like, and what you didn't in this particular session. All right? Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for giving you uh, your valuable time here. Thank you. Have a nice day.